And I just want to emphasize that um, this is an opportunity for people to hear from God because, and, and I think at Christmas, well, we're more open to, to coming into a church, to hearing more about uh, who Christ is and that message. So I invite you to, to consider that this week. Who in your life has God placed in the journey? Maybe where you work, maybe where you go to the gym, maybe in your neighborhood, that you would say, you know what, this would be a, a great opportunity for them to, to hear the gospel of Christ and you share the gospel of Christ. I don't have to, but to come into a service where we we're worshiping together it does make a difference I've known a number of people across the years that exchanged their old life for Christ new and in a Christmas Eve service so uh, we we hope that you'll come it's a family service by the way uh, so I'll be preaching two hours just to, to test your patience and you're no, I'm just kidding I won't uh, it's about an hour uh, you know we keep it to an hour or so and it's gonna be great some time for the kids to come up have a kids message so it, it'll be a, a fantastic time all right so um, over the past uh, gosh, two or three months, we've been talking about silence. And then in the last uh, couple of weeks, we turned our attention to looking at silence in the Christmas story. And today we're going to, to look at the identity of uh, who God is uh, as he, you know, kind of explains it and unfolds himself in the Christmas story. When I look at the Christmas story, sometimes I, I can empathize and connect with the players, the characters in the story, and the confusion that they might have uh, uh, experienced. I mean, here the shepherds doing whatever they do every day of their life, and they're out in the fields, and all of a sudden this this army of angels showed up, and it's like, wow, that that must have just. I mean, and we were told that they were freaked out, that they were afraid, that they, as any of us would be. And last week we looked at Zechariah and how Gabriel shows up and and stands, and he was too was freaked out and trying to you know figure all this these things out. Joseph, hey, here's a word for you, your fiance say is uh, going to be pregnant and uh, but she's never been with another man and never had a relationship there and that's like wow that that that's not confusing at all so you look through all the story and there's confusion uh, just from a human point of view mary is no exception she is the focus of our attention today uh, and we're going to look at her life in such a way that there's an identity moment and in these identity moments, she's internalizing. She, we're told that she's pondering, she's treasuring, she's wondering. And I propose to you that as human beings, this is what is necessary for us to have a true relationship with God. In other words, there are, there are moments in our lives that we just internally, silently say to ourselves, hey, wait a minute. Maybe, maybe I've got this thing turned around. Maybe God is who he thought he was. I grew up in a very ritualistic uh, religious home. Uh, we were churchgoers. And so it meant nothing to me. God meant nothing to me. I had no relationship with God. I, the only time I prayed was, bless this food, O Lord, to the nourishment of our bodies and us to thy service. Nothing wrong with that prayer. But it's not a, it, it wasn't a relationship that was personal where I had that, that interactivity, that interaction with God all the time. And so it was that internalizing that I began to like, hey, wait a minute, those moments, you know what I'm talking about. Many of you have had them and some of you are having them right now. We're going to look at the, hey, wait a minute moments of Mary. Because here's the thing, we have to come to the conclusion that we are natural beings. We operate in a natural world. We operate in a world of science and mathematics. We operate in a world that's downstream of the, the age of reason, the age of enlightenment. And for that reason, sometimes we try to figure out God through the lenses of the natural, that we're trying to say, oh, let me, let me identify him through science or through uh, my reason or my logic. And then God enters the story, as he did in the Christmas story, supernaturally, through angels, through hosts of angels, through speaking from heaven. And that does not compute in a natural world. I had a, a, a fellow that, uh, that came to my office this week, never met him before. He was just kind of passing by, knocked on my door. He might be in our crowd today or even watching. I, I invited him. But we had a wonderful conversation 
And he began the, the, the conversation by saying, I'm an atheist. And I said, uh, I said, do you really, do you really believe that? Because it requires a lot of faith to be an atheist, to, to, to realize that all of these things came into being on their own. About five minutes in, he said, well, maybe I'm an agnostic. And I said, I get you now, see, because an agnostic really is a searcher. I'm trying to figure it out. I'm not anti-God. I wasn't anti-God in my 20s, but I was trying to figure it out through my own reasoning. And God at times says, let me break through that reasoning. Now watch. If you don't lean into the supernatural, you will be frustrated in your search for God through the natural. In fact, if you're only trying to figure out God through the natural, you most likely will turn God off. You will say, it doesn't, he doesn't exist, the Bible is not true, and all of those arguments that we have. My invitation to you, whether you're searching for God or you are a Christ follower, my invitation for us today is that we must open ourselves up to the world that we cannot see. The Bible is full of that, and the Bible only makes sense. And when we say, God, I'm asking you to open my, my other set of eyes, not just my physical eyes, but my spiritual eyes, I believe that God is extremely faithful to answer that prayer. So let me show you a, a, a diagram that, that we're going we're gonna to talk about our identity and who we are. And I think that's established in two directions, who we see God as and who we see ourselves as. So let me give you an example with a scripture verse that comes from 1 John. If we, if we look in 1 John chapter 3, here's something about God that we learn in the Bible. See what kind of love the Father has given to us. Like, wow, God is a lover. God gives us love. And that we should be called children of God. And this is what we are. And so we are. And so you see the duality when I begin to look at God and say and, and believe like, man, there is a God who really loves me and I'm a child of God. It changes the whole my whole worldview, my whole set of lenses. If I think that I just came out of nothing, that there is no God and that I'm living my life in the natural world, just trying to do the best I can and be nice and try to make a living and then retire and then die. It's going to affect the way I live and how I see things. Are you tracking? So we begin today in the Christmas story, and we're going to look at Mary. It's fascinating. So I'm going to, it's going to require some, uh, some uh, open eyes, and it's going to require some thinking cap. I always like to, to tell you, you know, sometimes we have a near thinking cap. Sometimes we need a shower cap. Sometimes we need a baseball cap. Today's thinking cap, all right? We're going to look at these moments in Mary that I... I think must have been showstoppers. They must have been showstoppers for her, where it's like internally, that moment. Wow. Wait a minute. Wait. Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm seeing God or Jesus in a different way, and I'm seeing perhaps myself in a different way. Let's jump in. Luke chapter 1, verse 28. Luke chapter 1, verse 28. The angel went to Mary and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled inside. She didn't say anything. Just inside, like, whoa, that, what do you mean I'm highly favored? Troubled his words. And inside, internally, silently, wondered what kind of greeting that might be. I'm just doing my thing. I'm a young woman, and all of a sudden, an angel appears to me, freak out factor, you know, about the third or fourth time here in the story, and then you are highly favored, and inside she goes, wow, what? silently, what? who am I? Let me propose, the first step of our journey with God is this, we recognize that God is a personal God, it is personal God, what I mean by that is that there is no way to have a relationship with a statue. There's no way to have a great relationship with thousands of gods, as the Greeks try to teach us. There's no way to have a relationship with God who would be a God that only wants to communicate with us in eternity and not now. 
You see, the God of the Bible is communicating and interacting throughout the entire Bible with everyday human beings just like me and you. This is a universal sign for everyday human beings, by the way. God is an interactor. He's a personal God. Many of us know this scripture from Psalm 139. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, that means in, my, in your mother's womb, in the depths of the earth, Adam's name means earth, right? We are human beings, we are clay in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. It was still a fetus, if I might use that word. And so it, it is the biblical proof. It's not a political statement. It is a biblical proof that life begins at conception. And life begins at conception. And I know for us that you know, believe in that we're pro-life, we're like, yes, that's true. But it's, it's that, but it's deeper than that. It's deeper than that because God miraculously, are you ready? Supernaturally. This is where it begins. Supernaturally is a personal God before you take your first blink or you can even take a blink. Before your eyes are totally formed, before your lungs can, are formed to breathe. So it's, it's bigger than a political statement. It's that there is value in every soul that walks the earth and God knows them intimately before they even take their first breath. And so... Uh, he goes on to say in verse 16 of 139 Psalm, uh, all the days that I have are planned, are ordained, are blessed, are God saturated. Even were written in your book before my first spank on the bottom. Welcome to the world. Before the umbilical cord is cut, God knows us. We have a personal God. So when, when, when Mary is doing her thing, all of a sudden God is not a foreign deity. He's not a generic God. So here's the first thing I, I believe that we see, if we can go to the diagram. The first thing that Mary does is that God knows you intimately. What that means then is that your identity is that you are treasured. Now, why in the world does that make a difference? Why does it make a difference you know, when you're having your worst day or a bad day, it's important to recognize you're treasured. If somebody makes you feel otherwise, is if they're talking about you uh, behind your back or they're, you know, uh, mischaracterizing you or they're or, or whatever, uh, or in those days where you're talking badly about yourself, that you're worth nothing, this changes how we act and how we respond, no matter who we are, no matter how we've been, no matter where we've been, no matter how we've acted, God has treasured you before you've taken your first blink, before you've taken your first breath. And that changes how we respond to the world around us. So the first step, if we can go to the next slide, and we begin with personal. I believe that you'll never have a relationship with God unless you begin at that personal level that you got a God that really cares about you. you got a God that really cares about you. Otherwise, it'd be some old man sitting on the throne with a long beard who's really angry. Uh, no thanks. No thanks. If he's just a general deity that has no interactions with human beings, no thanks. I don't need that. But God is a personal God. As beautiful as this is, it presents a problem. Isn't there always one? And here's the problem. If God is a personal God, then you have to deal with him. It is so much easier to discard an impersonal God. If God is a statue, hey, who cares? I don't have to have a relationship with him. But if you have and understanding and lean into your supernatural eyes and open them up and say, hey, there's a God and, he's, and he really cares about me, then all of a sudden you recognize something that's a little disturbing. And today, to be honest with you, we're tracking Mary's life, but I'm also telling you Steve's life. Because I began in my 20s to begin to search for God. And I searched for God because I knew he was, I realized he was a personal God. God, you know, kind of reveals these things to you. But then there, there's something that, that happens in that search for a personal God. Wow, he is different than me. I have some imperfections. Then they begin to kind of show up. Watch this. 
in John chapter 16 and verse 18. And when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the entire world, not just a certain group of people. Every single human being that, that, that God, God treasures everyone, he's going to convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. So let me show you the next diagram. When we begin to search for a personal God, here's what we recognize right off the bat. God is perfect and you are not. Notice I put you and not me. Just kidding. <laughs> So that we, all of a sudden, when I began to read the Bible, like, wow, and I've, I've told some of you before, I started reading, you know, as you would in any book, which is on the, you know, the left side of the book, and I began to read the Old Testament. And the more I read the Old Testament, the worse I felt. You'd think, hey, you're reading the Bible, you must feel pretty good. Nope, feeling pretty crummy, because I'm looking like, wow, they killed people over that sin. I'm like, and I've done a lot of that, so I should have been dead a long time ago. And the more I read, the more guilty I felt, and the more I read, the more I understood that God was perfect and I wasn't. And that created the dilemma, and listen carefully, this is the feeding pond for religion. In other words, that separation between you and God, religion comes in and says, well, you've got to come through me, a pastor or a priest, to make it right with God. You have to do certain things. You've got to obey the golden rule enough. You've got to uh, do the Ten Commandments enough. You have to be a good neighbor enough, and maybe, just maybe, just maybe, that separation will be bridged, but you never know until you take your last breath and are standing before God. Did I get it right? Who wants to live like that? Not me. So Mary, all of a sudden, is in this conversation with the angel. And of course, the angel comes, highly favored. She freaks out like everybody else did when they see an angel. And the angel said to her in Luke chapter 2 and verse 10, do not be afraid. Every time they speak, isn't that cool? Hey, don't freak out. I'm bringing some good news. I bring you good news. And uh, this is to the shepherds, sorry. And so the shepherds are out there, but they bring the message. To so the shepherds say, do not, the angel said, do not be afraid. Who said it? Okay, sorry. <laughs> angel said to the shepherds, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today, in the town of David, Bethlehem, a bridge is coming. A gap closer is coming. A savior is coming that will take that separation between imperfect and perfect and bridge the gap. Watch this. He is Christ the Lord. So in verse uh, 15, 16, so they heard off, the shepherds heard off and found Mary and Joseph and baby and baby was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word, including Mary and Joseph, concerning what they had been told about this child. What were they told about this child? This is the bridge maker. There is a savior because as you begin to be convicted of sin and you think, oh man, I can't reach up. I can't do enough to be good enough. And now you find out that all of a sudden Mary recognizes like, I'm not just giving birth to a baby. I'm giving birth to the rescuer, to the solution of the gap. I mean, just think if you're Mary, you're thinking, wow, the, who, I am also a sinner. Mary is just like everyone else. She's a human being in need of a savior. And she was giving birth to the savior. So her, her identity is like, man, I'm separated from God. And, and, and she, her, she now sees Christ, the upcoming baby, as the Savior. Watch this. All who heard it were amazed. Maybe that was the beginning of amazing grace at what the shepherd said. But watch this. But Mary silently treasured up all these things and silently pondered them in her heart. So here's the second step. Let's go to the diagram. So the second step looks like this. It starts at personal, and then you recognize there's a separation that Christ is willing to, to bridge. This is the challenge that, that we have in, in the human race. Think globally. Religion is so rampant, and it's so rampant because it says, I'm offering you the solution. 
And the solution comes through Christ at a great price. Hey, by the way, just wanted to point something out. How much do you think these shoes cost? <laughs> what? What's that? $22. No, there was no shipping. Yeah, th easy. There was no shipping. If there was shipping, I wouldn't have done it. A few weeks ago, I, I was sharing with our church family, if you're new today, like, what in the world is he talking about shoes, uh, that I ordered these pair of shoes uh, on Black Friday for 22 bucks. Now, they're used. I got them used. <laughs> and I know. But uh, some of you, I'm not going to name names, just on the front row, asked me, uh, <laughs> I wonder if you get them, if they'll be the same size. Yes, they are. <laughs> And they feel great. You know, my granddad was also, let's say, thrifty. And he tells this story that he, he went to a yard sale and he bought an umbrella. And he would tell the story over and over. He brought, he brought this umbrella for 25 cents. And then he was shopping around the yard sale and everything. And he drove, you know, four or five miles home. And he got home and recognized that he, lost, he had forgot the umbrella at the yard sale. So... Part of our DNA was like, well, if I drive back and then I drive back, then the gas that I'm going to use, I sorry, calculate. So he walked back about four or five miles. <laughs> <laughs> and then he, he got the umbrella. And he was, he was so proud of that story. To the point that my mom driving over on Christmas Day, I'm like, I hope he doesn't tell the umbrella story one more time. Yeah, we've, we've heard it. <laughs> Here's where I can say that me and God are not the same. God is not a cheapskate. God is not a cheapskate. I mean, seriously, he gave the only boy he had. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The only begotten Son he ever had. To give a savior to the world. How dare religion cheapen his gift. We trust in Jesus. And for the, separate, for the, the solution to the separation. Then something crazy happens. Jesus is 12 years old. We fast forward a dozen years. Luke chapter 2 verse 48. Uh, he, they had lost him. If you've ever been a parent, lost your kid in the grocery store, you'll know it's, uh, it's uh, quite alarming. They were freaked out. They were looking for him. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. They found him in the temple teaching, 12 years old. His mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? Why did you wander away? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. He said, why were you searching for me? Didn't you know I was in my father's house? Joseph is standing right there. See, he's speaking supernaturally. He's not talking about natural. I know you're my natural dad. You know, uh, you know, not even by biological terms, but you know, you're you're the one that's raising me. But I'm talking. He's talking about supernaturally. I'm in my father's house. Didn't they not understand what he was? And they did not understand silently. Like what? Right? There was a moment, there was a, there was a showstopper moment here. But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them, was obedient to them. But his mother silently treasured all these things in her heart. So I just want to stop on a couple points here. First of all, notice that every step along the way, Mary is like, hmm, I'm pondered, I'm troubled, I'm, I'm treasuring. Silently. This is what's required to grow in your walk and your relationship with God. These moments. So right now, God may be nudging you, stirring you, making you uncomfortable even. It's God trying to have those moments where you're like, wow, okay, okay. He's a personal God. There's a separation, but he provided the, the gap, the bridge. I don't have to do that. through. Really, see, all these things. So in this moment, what Christ is doing, we can't miss it. When he equates himself with God, he said, this is my father's house. This is what ticked off the religious people on the day because he was making himself equal to God. 
He was stating in this moment, and they understood it more in that culture than we did now. When he said, I'm in my father's house, what he is saying is, I am God in the flesh. Listen, I'm sure that Christ is honored when we think of him as a good man, that he was a good teacher, perhaps even a prophet. But all of those things are not good enough. I'll tell you why. Because there are plenty of good men that died throughout history. There are plenty of prophets who died throughout history. There are plenty of teachers, good teachers, who have died throughout history. But they prove nothing in bridging the gap between you and God. On the cross, there did not need to be a hero or a martyr or just a good man. On the cross, there needed to be a perfect, sinless Lamb of God, the Messiah that has been spoken about through all of human history, of the, the one that we've waited for, it had to be the Son of God, God in the flesh on the cross. If we want to compartmentalize Jesus as a good teacher, then we really missed the boat, and that relationship can't happen because we must put our faith that Christ was fully God and fully man, and that way he became the mediator of the world. Now, I know that's heavy, but I warned you, you got to put your thinking cap on and open your spiritual eyes. It is not enough that a good man died for others. Soldiers are doing that every day. Police men and women are doing that every day. It's not enough. It doesn't resolve the human dilemma of the separation between God and man. It was God who had to come and God who had to die and God who had to be raised from the dead. It was God. So Christ is saying, I am unlimited. I am unlimited. Because when I'm reading the Old Testament, I'm like, hey, I bet God forgives some but doesn't forgive other sins. That's what I was taught as a kid. He's going to forgive this one, this one, and this one. But if you do this one, not going to get forgiveness. And Christ comes as the Son of God and says, it's unlimited. You're limited. I'm unlimited. So watch this. Here's a new identity. Christ is unlimited and you are limited. Just think about Mary like, man, this is the Son of God. And eternity, then we begin to think, man, eternity, if he's the son of God, that means eternity forever and ever and ever. That's unlimited. So we begin, let's kind of, I want to track along because I know I'm giving you a lot of points this morning. We begin that you've got to start somewhere. God is personal. And maybe you're right here in the room thinking, man, I, that's where I'm start. That's where I'm at. Maybe you're at home and you're thinking, man, this is where I'm start. Then I'm like, hey, I'm recognizing right now there's a separation. And then eternity is at stake. There's sobering moments along the way that sometimes our mortality, like, wow, man, this thing is, this thing is real. Maybe you've had a friend that died suddenly. Maybe you yourself have had a brush with death. Those are the moments where you think, hey, you know what? There's more to life than, than just, just this. A couple more points before we, we go on. In Matthew chapter 12, this must have been another show-stopping identity moment for Mary. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 47, someone told Jesus, Hey, your mother and brothers are standing outside, and they just want to want to have coffee with you. They want to have a word with you. They'd like to speak to you. And he replied, Who is my mother and my brothers? And who are my brothers? Let me just say, don't ever say that to your mom. As, you know, you're not Jesus, okay? So Because he's making a deeper point. Pointing to his disciples that were sitting around, and he said, here are my mother and my brothers. I mean, just think about Mary, for example. She's, she's like, wow, they've already had this temple encounter. I'm in my father's house. Like, wow, what? I thought Joseph was raising you, and now it's changed. And now, what? You're saying these are your, that, that's your mother? Then, he's, then he reveals it, for whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my mother and my sister, my brother, and my sister, and my mother. Now, let me speak to those of you that are Christ followers. Up to this journey, you come to this place where God is personal, there's a separation, you recognize there's a Savior, and then there's eternity involved, and now you've made this commitment. But the Christian life is not a checkbox to be checked. The Christian life is to be closely related in a life of surrender. Now, I don't know about you, but it seems like not even a daily thing for me, a daily need. It seems like an hourly need. 
Christ is asking us to surrender our time, our ambitions, our money, our hobbies, our relationships, our families. Our families are not our God. All of those things. And at that moment, Mary has this, like she, she must have just silently stepped back and like, oh, that's what this is about. He's not only my Savior, but he's my Lord. And he's calling me into a deeper relationship with him. You see the journey? God begins as personal. So here's the next identity. God offers us life, but we lose ours to get it. That's surrender. And so let's track a little bit in the next slide. So God's personal. We're separated. He offers us unlimited eternity, but now he's asking for surrender. Here's one last thing. Are you thinking? <laughs> Here's the last thing. Jesus is hanging on the cross. It's going to be yet one more identity moment for Mary. Near the cross of Jesus, John 19, stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mom there, the disciple whom he loved, John, is standing nearby. And he said to his mother, Dear woman, speaking from a son's point of view, look at John. He's your new son. Identity, identity moment. And to John, he said, here's your mother. And from that time on, the disciple took her into his home. You see, in that moment, Jesus was saying, you move from this really kind of impersonal God to a personal God, and then you bridge the separation through the Savior. You're asked to, to see him as he is, the Son of God, and an unlimited life is given to you, but we lose our life. But then he says at the end, and this is where, you know, if you look at relationships, if I say, hey, what's the relationships that you should have? Okay, you should have one with God, your identity with yourself, but with others. And I propose to you this, that your relationship with others, your husband, your wife, your friends, your coworkers, your employees, your employer, everything is gauged by who you see yourself as and, and who God is. In other words, your relationship, the Bible says, is just an outflow of those two things. If you see yourself as an expert, you're going to treat other people lower than you are. If you see yourself as better than others, you're going to treat people lower than you are. If you tr see yourself as unworthy of anything in your life, you will live your life that way, and you'll have to try to prove yourself. There's a lot that comes out of these two relationships. And what God is saying here at the end to John and his mom, he says, it's deeper than this. I'm now leaving the planet, so you need each other in a deep way. David is speaking to his Jonathan in this moment. Paul is speaking to his Timothy. John, Jesus is speaking to his John, his best friend. And he says, I need you to be in relationship with my mom. In fact, to the point that he's your son. That is what Christ is calling us to. That's why we say, hey, can we get smaller in our relationships? Because when we do, we begin to reflect who God really is. Does that make sense? God is calling us on a journey. And everybody has a story about God, about you. The question is this, where are you in your story? I want you to think about that. Are you, ex are you experiencing God for the first time right now? He's personal. Room that we're are you at that place like, man, I got to deal with this. And so we wanted God to knows me, so I've got to build time that separation. For those of you that are watching Maybe you're online. like, man, Jesus is more We've than just today a regular guy. We've talked today about identity and, and story, and, and everybody has a story. Sometimes we think that God is so big and so distant that there's no way that he can be in tune with who we are as individuals. But the Bible has a different story and a different angle on that. The Bible says that God clearly knows us at an intimate level. So the question for you as we, before we go into prayer and as we close is, where are you in your story with God? Some of you may be in that moment, that, that chapter where you're, you're realizing God is personal. Some of you may be in a position in your life that you realize that there's a separation between you and God. Others may be 
identifying with something inside of you that's eternal, that you that God has put this eternity, this sense of eternity in your heart, and you're just becoming aware of that. Others of you have may have already trekked through those chapters, and now you're at a point of you know that you need to surrender to God. And others of you that may be at a point in your life where you're sensing the need of relationships. So everybody is at a different stage in in our stories. I am, you are. So I'm going to pray with you as we close today. And this could be perhaps one of the most important conversations you'll ever have in your life because the conversation that we have with God, especially in that moment where for those of you that are searching for God and, and you're You're trying to figure it all out. Sometimes I understand that's confusing. I've been through that myself when I exchanged my old life for Christ's new one. So I want to pray, and I'm going to ask you to to do your very best to, to be uncluttered in this moment, that you might just put aside everything you're worried about, everything you've got to do, everything that's going to happen in the next in the next five minutes to all afternoon, and just focus in. To, to you and God alone. And, and just begin to, to sense where God has you in this story. And especially for those of you that have never come to Christ and depended completely on him, this is a time for you to, to take inventory and to, to have some time with God. So I'm going to invite you to pray. And uh, just wherever you are, Uh, in your living room, in your apartment, in your car, wherever you are, I invite you to quiet yourself and, uh, and we'll spend some time with God together. So I would ask you to pray with me. Father, we're so grateful with this mind blowing truth that you know every single one of us at such an intimate level. With that in mind, God, we come to you and approach you wherever we are in our story. Some might be just figuring this out, to, to, uh, discovering the reality that you are personal and not distant. You are, you are intimate and not generic. Others may be at that point of conviction where they, they sense that I want to know God and yet there's a separation and realize that there's a savior in between us and you. Others may be ready to uh, explore, what does this mean to have eternal life? Others may be ready to surrender. Others may be in such desperate need for relationships. So wherever we are, God, we want you to meet us. We're asking for you to meet us where we are because we know that you're faithful. So especially, God, for those who have never come to you in a childlike faith, a simple faith, and exchange their old life for your new one, God, we're, we're going to focus right there in this moment. So if you're at home, if you're in your car, wherever you are, listening, watching, this is a time for you to speak to God. And speak honestly. Speak your own language. I'm going to guide you through a a, a, a a prayer, but it needs to come from your heart. Your conversation needs to be raw and honest with God. And as you approach God, we just we open up our heart, our minds, and and pray something along these lines. God, I know that you've created me. I know that you've made all things and. And God, I know that you want to know me, that you've pursued me. Now, God, I pursue you. Would that be your prayer? I want to know you personally, God. And I recognize that I'm imperfect and that you're perfect and there's a distance between you and I. And there's a separation. And that separation, as, as you're speaking God, to God, that separation was bridged, not by your good behavior, not by being more religious, but that, that bridge was, was created by God 
through his son Jesus Christ on the cross, who died for your sins in your place on the cross. There is one mediator between God and man, the Bible says, and that is Jesus Christ, our Savior. So in this moment, God would be calling you and inviting you to trust, not in religion, not in your good behavior, not in changing your behavior, but trust in Christ, the Savior, alone. This is what Christmas is all about. It's, it's good to have decorations and lights and all those beautiful things. But the true meaning of Christmas can come home to you right now. Put your faith in Christ. Speak to him. God, I, I don't trust in anything or anyone else. I put my trust in Christ. I depend on Christ to bridge the gap between you and me. I ask you, God, to forgive all my sins. Is this your prayer? Is this your genuine prayer? I ask you, God, to see my heart that I am wanting you in my life. And I'm asking for a personal, intimate, real relationship with you. I come simply, but I come honest. I come honestly, God. And so, Father, I want to be your child. Is that your prayer? In your own language, I want to be your child. I want to be secure in our relationship. I don't want to worry about it. I want to, I want to have heaven and eternity secure in my life. I want my identity not to be as a religious person, but as a child of God. So, Father, I come. I come to you and ask God for a new life in me. I take the life that I've been leading, I turn 180 degrees toward you, and I turn in my old life, I exchange it for the one that you can give through Christ. Is that your prayer? God has been waiting all your life for this moment. Why not give your heart to Christ? I promise you it will be the best, it will be the best Christmas of your life. Because you'll know the Savior who came for us. Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. Thank you for making it so clear. We thank you for the lives of all the imperfect people and that you've recorded in your word so that we ourselves might understand that we, like all people, all sheep have gone astray and we need a Savior. So thank you for Christmas. Thank you for the meaning of Christmas, the true meaning of Christmas, that because you loved us so much,